Good morning, church. It is a blessing to be together here this morning. We are continuing a series today, but before we dive into that, we need to say another prayer, and so if you would join me. Father God, thank you, thank you, thank you for this time that we have. God, we're just so appreciative of being together. And God, even though it's cold outside, it is, it is nice to be warmed by the presence of your people. Uh, Father, to look around and see brothers and sisters and loved ones here together, seeing young and old together, all coming for one purpose, one reason, and that is to declare the glory and worth of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, he is worthy of all our praise. God, he is worthy of all of our worship. And God, this moment, this hour and a half that we, we spend together on a Sunday morning, it, it merely reflects the life of, of the disciples that gather here weekly, that gather here for Bible studies throughout the week. Because God, it is our aim to honor you. And God, we pray that we do that today and we do that every day. God, we're thankful for our visitors that are here this morning. We pray a blessing over them, Father, that they would be encouraged by our assembly. Father, that they would feel warm and welcome here. God, that we would go out of our way to make sure that the visitor uh, is always, always a priority. And God, that we would demonstrate the love that was demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, as we continue our series Game Changer, it's, it's my prayer that you would be merciful to the speaker. Uh, Father, that he would not get in the way of your perfect message. But God, the things that are of you, the things that are true, noble, and pure, God, that those things would stick to the hearts of your people. Father, that the story of the resurrection, the story that the tomb is empty, that your son has risen and conquered over death, that all of us would realize it changes everything. Father, it changes everything. Everything. And so, Father, may your people, may those who are skeptical here, take one step to letting that reality sink in in a deeper way. Father, we love you. We are very thankful for our Bibles that capture these stories that we're able to reflect on and meditate on. And, Father, it's, it's our prayer this morning that your word would speak. God, thank you for your son. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. And the whole church said, amen. So let me try to catch all of us up real quick. 2,000 years ago, a guy named Jesus showed up on the world. Not the most groundbreaking news for many of you. Stick with me. A guy named Jesus shows up on the planet. And he is proclaimed as someone special. He's known as a miracle worker. He's known as a teacher, and some, some even dare to claim that he is the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. But then, at the height of his ministry, at around 30 AD, days after he's welcomed into Jerusalem as a king, he is put to death. He's murdered. And at that point, game over. And what's interesting is that Scripture actually captures this moment for us. And if you read Scripture, if you are a reasonable or rational person, what you will see is that Scripture does not paint a very pretty picture in that snapshot if that was the end of the story. Because if that was the end of the story, the picture that scripture paints is that the Jesus movement, the way of Jesus, the followers of Jesus are not going to be around for long. But then, three days later, early on a Sunday morning, word broke that the tomb was empty. Word broke that Jesus, the man, was risen from the dead. 
Now, this morning, if you find yourself a little bit skeptical of that, if you're, if you're here and, and you're just kind of here because of obligation, maybe you're here to make sure that someone doesn't get mad at you. Maybe it's your mom. Maybe it's your sweetheart. You don't want mom or your sweetie to get mad at you. And so you're here, but you're not really sure if you believe in the whole resurrection thing. Maybe you used to believe, but you're not sure if you really believe anymore because, you know, it's the resurrection. I, I just don't know if I can really believe in someone coming back from the dead. Let me talk to you for 30 seconds. Stick with me just for 30 seconds here because this is important. If you are skeptical of the resurrection this morning, if that's where you are, you need to know that you are in good company. Because the earliest, closest followers of Jesus did not believe in the resurrection initially. They were skeptical initially. They found themselves saying... That just is unbelievable. No one comes back from the dead. And yet, they had to face his face. And it it was in that moment when they saw him face to face that the unbelievable somehow was undeniably believable. Face to face, they met him. Seeing the holes in his hands, they met him. And all of a sudden, they were faced with the fact that Jesus was who he said he was. That he was actually the son of God. That he wasn't just some teacher. He wasn't some miracle worker. He was those things, but he was much more than those things. He was God in the flesh. And God had conquered Over death. And so these early disciples, these early followers, they had this resurrection religion. They had this belief that new life was possible. They had this belief that all of a sudden they themselves could take on an identity that was so unbelievable that before the resurrection they just never ever really believed it was possible. See, part of Jesus' teaching was just so hard to comprehend. It was just so hard to believe that it wasn't till the resurrection that they found themselves, that the earliest believers found themselves saying, maybe Jesus wasn't kidding. Maybe we can actually live in a way as Jesus commanded us to live. And so the point of this series, Game Changer, is to work through some of the unbelievable commands that Jesus pitches out there. And today we're going to kick it off. Are you ready? Wow, that was really believable. Okay, are you ready? Okay, are you sure? Okay, (laughs) here is the first command that Jesus offers that just seems unbelievable. It is, thou shall not fear. I thought I'd go King James on us this morning. Thou shall not fear. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone speaks into my life and they're like, hey, this is what you need to do, there's a part of me that's like, you know, dude, don't tell me what to do. Like, don't, don't tell me how to live my life. Maybe it's just the millennial in me, but don't tell me how to live my life. It's my life. I can live my, you're, who are you to tell me how to live my life? And so when Jesus is like, do not fear, I'm like, wait, what? Say, what? You don't fear? What kind of command is that? Are you afraid? Yeah, I'm kind of afraid. Don't fear. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thou shall not fear. Let me break it down for you. Here's what it means. It means this, fear not. Or if you don't get that one, go to the next one. Here we go. Do not be afraid. That's what this means. If you're afraid, stop it. Don't be afraid. Are you scared? Stop it. Do not fear. This is actually one of Jesus' favorite commands that he tosses out to his early disciples. Matthew records this a lot. In the scriptures, he comes back to this teaching over and over and over again in different stories. And Jesus continues to meet his disciples in their moments of fear, in their moments of doubt. With this command, do not be afraid. 
So in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus handpicks these 12 guys that are going to follow him. And he sends them out into the world. Sends them out to search for the lost sheep of Israel. And then he says that these people will eventually get eaten. That these 12 men, they will be tossed into the court scene and they will be flogged. And then he says this, but don't be afraid. (laughs) They're going to beat you. They're going to take you to court. They're going to mistreat you, but don't be afraid. What do you mean, don't be afraid? How can you not be afraid when someone's going to persecute you like this? And so Jesus eventually gives this teaching, Zach, if you will, in Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 28. He says this, And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Wait a second, you're, you're telling us not, not to be afraid, but then you, you're saying to be afraid. And Jesus is like, guys, listen to me here. Don't be afraid. Yeah, but you said just be afraid. No, 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 guys, just listen to me here. Pay attention. Do not be afraid of the person who can kill your body, but can't kill your soul. I imagine the disciples, I imagine Peter especially, like scratching his head, like, I just don't get this. And so Jesus continues on. He says this, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Two sparrows, I mean, it was literally nothing at that time. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. He continues, but even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. So Jesus looks at his disciples and says, Hey, fellas, listen to me. You know the sparrows? You're, not, you're more valuable than the sparrows. And so you've got to trust God because God is in control of the sparrows. And, and I, could, I could see the disciples there. They're like, wait a second. But the, God watched those sparrows hit the ground. Like, I mean, did, you just see them. There, down on the ground. And God watched that. Yes, 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 yes. But don't be afraid. Because your father is in control. Now what's really interesting, in the midst of this teaching, two chapters earlier, Jesus had offered them this teaching in a snapshot. And it was in a very practical, fear-filled moment. It's in Matthew chapter 8, verse 31. Matthew chapter 8. Go ahead to the next slide. Sorry, verse 23. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. In that portion of text, Jesus has just got off working the crowds. He's been healing a lot of people. People have been coming to him. And so Jesus decides that he needs to leave the crowd. They have been surrounding him. They've been coming to him. And so Jesus decides he needs to go to the other side. And so Jesus didn't have six tricked out escalades to jump in to leave the crowd, to leave the posse. All he had was a boat. And so he would hop in the boat and he would go from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And he would go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Well, it was in the middle of the Sea of Galilee that he has this experience. And here's what it says, starting in verse 23. He says this. <clears throat> And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, because that's what disciples do. He continues on saying this, And behold, there arose a great storm, not a small storm, a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. Now, i got to admit, there's a part of me that I just wonder about this portion of text. Because, and this, this, is nowhere, this is nowhere in the text, this is, this is David. Jesus knows all things, right? So I wonder if like Matthew looks at Jesus and he's like, oh, he's sleeping. But it's like one of those moments that you parents know, like you, you're sleeping in your kid's eyes, but you're actually awake. You guys familiar with that? And all the kids are like, shh, dad's sleeping. But you're actually awake, so you're paying attention. So Matthew, Matthew says, hey, you know what? Jesus is asleep. 
I got a feeling maybe, 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 I don't know. Jesus is asleep. And, and they're scared because this great storm is there. They're afraid. And so it says this, and they went and awoke him, saying, Save us, Lord. We are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? I can imagine one of the disciples wanting to say at that moment, uh, permission to speak freely, sir. <clears throat> we are perishing. We are sinking. Look around at the great storm that we are in. Water is filling our boat. Jesus, I'm a professional fisherman, and I am scared to death. We are in a very troubling situation. I get it. You were a carpenter. Your dad was a carpenter. Okay, I get it. You haven't been on the lake a lot. This is a bad situation to be in. Okay? So why are you so afraid? Because when you are perishing, you are afraid. When you are perishing, you are afraid. It's simple. When you are perishing, you are afraid. Oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. And I love this line, underlined in my Bible. I love, 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 love this line. The disciples, after this experience, imagine they're going back and forth. You know, Andrew is hung over the side, puking his guts out. I mean, everybody's like, this is crazy. And then Jesus gets up and, and it says this. And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. And there's only one answer to that. Super. He is a super man. That is who he is. That is who. What sort of man is this? He is a super man. There's no other way to describe him. He is a super man. He is unbelievable. What sort of man is this? And I love, I love the way different gospel writers will deal with these stories. Because in Mark, when we come to this point... It's really interesting the words that Mark chooses to write. Because in Mark, he writes something like this. He, he uses the verb form and the noun form of fear. And so it looks something like this. They feared a great fear. And so they are afraid as the storm is raging. And then Jesus gets up and he calms the storm. And they feared an even greater fear. <laughs> they went from fearing the storm to fearing the one who is in the boat with them. Now let me take a second to speak to some of you that are here this morning. You left faith. You left Jesus. Because you felt like God was sleeping on you when you were perishing. You checked out because in your moment of desperate need, it seemed like God had fallen asleep on you. In that moment of loss, in that moment of pain, in that moment when the storm was raging... And you prayed, and you prayed, and you prayed, and you prayed. And it just didn't seem like God was there. I want to speak to you for a second. And I want to encourage you to consider coming back. Consider taking the journey one step at a time to come back to faith, to believing and following Jesus. 
Because the earliest disciples know your feeling. In this story, they had a Lord. They had a teacher. And they were perishing. They felt like they were perishing. And they looked at him. And they saw he was asleep. (laughs) But in the end, he made everything all right. In the moment, it's difficult. In the moment, it's tough. But in the end, he will make everything all right. Now, the teaching doesn't end there. Because over in Matthew chapter 14, this storyline continues on. Matthew chapter 14, Jesus gets off feeding the 5,000. 5,000 men and and plus women and children. There's a number of people. Jesus is never absent of a crowd. People always trying to get close to Jesus. People always wanting to know what he has to say or to heal. And so in Matthew chapter 14, (laughs) Jesus is standing there and he decides that he's had enough of the crowd. And he tells the disciples that they're going to get in the boat. Now, Matthew Chapter 14, here's what the text says. Uh, this, is, this is perfect. Immediately, he, notice, made the disciples get into the boat. Why did Jesus have to make the disciples get in the boat? Because the last time they were in a boat, they were in a big storm. And so Jesus is like, okay, guys, I want to send you guys off ahead of me. I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to dismiss the crowd. Uh, You know what, Jesus? I don't feel like that's the best idea. I just, I feel like I'm not sure if you can handle the crowd. Are you saying I can't handle the crowd? Well, I'm not really saying that, but I just, I don't feel comfortable getting in the boat. I thought you were a fisherman. No, no, no. I just, I'm just not sure how I feel about this. Can you imagine the emotions that are running through them? Last time they were in a boat, they had this great storm and the guy stood up and made the winds go flat, made the waves go flat. And now he's like, you guys get in the boat by yourself. They're like, you know what? I never want to get in another boat without Jesus in the boat with me. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. He continues on. He went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Verse 24. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land. Beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in, here's our word again, fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Over and over and over again, Jesus speaks out this teaching. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Fear not. But Jesus, the boat is coming apart. Why are you afraid? Jesus, I I thought I saw a ghost. I, I just wasn't sure. Yeah, but why are you afraid? And this leads us to our teaching today. And it's this. You don't have to be afraid. Even when it seems like there's something to be afraid of. Listen, you don't have to be afraid. Even when it seems like there's something to be afraid of. Yeah, but Jesus, no, 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 no. You don't have to be afraid. Even when it seems like something is there that you need to be afraid of. But look at my family situation. You don't have to be afraid. Even when it seems like there's something to be afraid of. Now, I want us to internalize this. 
So I personalize it. I want you guys, I want you guys to read this, all right? Read it with me. I don't have to be afraid even when it seems like there's something to be afraid of. Let's do that again. I don't have to be afraid even when it seems like there's something to be afraid of. Now, you know what's beautiful about this? Is the early disciples didn't get this. Over and over and over again, Jesus says, don't be afraid. And what do they do? Fail. You don't have to be afraid. Fail. You don't have to be afraid. Fail. Over and over and over and over and over again. You don't have to be afraid. And they fail. Time and time again, fear paralyzes their heart. But then, the resurrection happened. And after the resurrection, these men went about their lives fearless. These men went about their lives fearless. It's not because persecution and hardship was absent. It's not because their life was perfect, their life was easy, their family situation was okay. It's because this, when they lost their fear of death, they feared not. When they lost their fear of death, they feared not. Because the greatest thing to fear is death. And when death had been conquered, they feared not. Peter could look eye to eye with Caiaphas and say, I don't have to be afraid of you. Because what can you do to me? Jesus looks at Caiaphas, looks at the religious leaders, looks at Pilate and says, the control you have, my father has given to you. He has perfect vision. And in the resurrection, every believer, if you're a believer here this morning, in the resurrection, if you can let your heart sink on this reality, on this storyline, you don't have to be afraid. Because when you see the resurrection, when you believe in the resurrection, you can fear not. And it dominated Christianity for hundreds of years. So in the second century, there was a doctor named Claudius Galenus. And and Claudius Galenus was uh, well known at the time. He's one of the leading doctors that we keep on file today of that time period. He was revolutionary uh, for the second century. And one of the things that really interests him was the dead body. But here's the problem. At the time, Rome had a rule that you could not explore a dead body. You could not research, do any findings on a dead body. And so what doctors would do is they would go to the arena and look at dying bodies. And often, it would be the dying bodies of Christians as they were tortured. Claudius Galenus And his writings, he speaks of Christians several times. And one time, I found it really interesting, I wanted to share with you. He says this, For fearlessness of death and the hereafter is something that we witness in them every day. Fearlessness of death and the hereafter is something we witness in them every day. Because... What is there to fear? Really, if you know that you serve a risen Savior. What is there to fear, brothers and sisters? When you know the one who has conquered over death and you can trust that he has the power 
over your life and over creation that he, even before the end of the world, is in control. You can walk about this life fearless. So let me speak to you for just a second. Let me, let me ask you, what are you afraid of? Think of the thing that scares you to your core. Think of the thing that terrifies you to the deepest parts of who you are. Close your eyes if you need to. Maybe for you it's losing a child. Maybe for you it's losing another child. Maybe for you it's financial. Or maybe for you it's something to do with your family. Maybe for you it's so big it's cultural. Listen to me. You don't have to be afraid. Even when it seems like there's something to be afraid of. Because your Savior has won. Every word that he has said is punctuated by the resurrection. And so you can fear not because you trust in him. And so you can go today about your day fearless. Today. That might not be you. Today, your heart may tremble with fear. You might be finding yourself resonating with Jesus' question, why do you have such little faith? The beautiful thing is your God has not turned you away, but it's inviting you closer He wants you to trust in this. He wants you to have security. He's not seeking to shame you. He's seeking to build you up. And so if you have doubts today, if you have fears today, I want to encourage you, come and receive prayers. Find yourself surrounded with brothers and sisters that love you and remind you that we are a people that are bold and that we can go about our life fearless today. 